Hey Soma, I'm Andrew. Thank you for joining us today. We have a great message and great worship, so enjoy the service. Come on. Is everybody feeling good this morning? All right. I'll see myself. Arise, my soul. Remember this He took my sin And He buried it No longer I who live Now Jesus lives in me For I was dead in sin But I woke up to see the light Silence. 
Manifest in our hearts and our minds this morning. Not only have we proclaimed and declared your name in worship, but God, may our hearts be prepared to receive what you have through the word for us this morning. Lord, you're faithful, your promises are true. Thank you for your love, your mercy. 
your provision and grace over our lives. We surrender this time to you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Can we just lift up a shout of praise to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords? Come on, he is worthy of our praise. Amen. Amen, amen. Hey guys, uh, for those of you who don't know me, I am Dan. I think Stephen mentioned that and I'm really glad to be here. Um, I do hate the circumstances I'm here. I hate that Michael's not feeling well, but I did speak to him yesterday on the phone and he seemed to be um, on the way up, just trying to make sure he's keeping people safe. And uh, I will say this, there's, the good news is I'm actually probably, I know I'm right here unmasked. I'm actually one of the safest people you can be around because I got the COVID last month and I've gotten over it. Uh, I have recovered uh, like a good father. I shared it with my children. And so I let them have it as well. Um, but no, all joking aside, I know this has been a really difficult time. And I know for many, um, they have not had it as mildly as I did. And so um, I know that's the case for many of you who are praying for them uh, and praying that God heals them and continues to work through them and, and comforts you. But uh, nonetheless, it is so good to be here with you and to be talking about listening to God's voice as we're continuing in this series called Hey God. And, and Hey God, as we, as we speak to him and Hey God, as we hear from him and listen to what he has to say in our lives and how we work with others. And I know a lot of the focus on this, as Michael was talking to me about it, um, is prayer. And I know, I don't, I don't know about you guys, but prayer, it's very much a struggle for me to have any kind of consistent or rich prayer life. And I think we all get into rote prayers, right? Like those, those um, prayers that we just kind of repeat right? That maybe even aren't that good. Like they're not sinful or anything, but they're just not that good. I, I have the prayers that I pray, like, you know, when we pray for meal, right? And uh, even like we have those little phrases, right? Bless this food to the nourishment in our bodies. We don't even know what that means. We just say it, right? Uh, I don't think it's wrong, but we say it and we don't, we don't know what it means. I, when I'm praying for my children at night, especially my younger two, as I'm tucking them in, my, my oldest is nearly 15. He doesn't really like for me to tuck him in anymore, but... Um, but as I'm tucking my daughters in bed with my wife and I, and I pray for them, I tend to pray the same thing over and over again, right? And, I, and they're good things. I'm praying that God uh, will bless them, that they'll know him, that they'll want to know his word, right? But the, I've, I've had those moments, right? Maybe you've had these as parents where you look down and you're praying for your children and you see them mouthing the words with you because they know what you're getting ready to say, right? Because there's no creativity there. It's like, oh, mom and dad, you're just praying for those same things over and over again. And so what happens is it becomes a routine and we think that our routine is doing more than actually God involving themselves in our lives. And that's one of the things we want to look out for. And so we want to see being able to think through how to pray and how to pray biblically and how to listen for what God may be doing as we pray. And so sometimes one of the best things we can do is look at people who have come before us and look at how they've prayed. Look at how they've prayed in scripture. Look at the prayers that God has answered in scripture. And so one of the places we're going to look at that today is in the book of 1 Samuel. So if you've got a Bible or, or a Bible app, you can go and open up to 1 Samuel 3. We're going to be there in a minute. Uh, but we're going to look at a very real prayer that was answered in a woman's life in the Bible. A woman who my wife and I are big fans of. We named one of our daughters after her. And so this is a great thing to look at. But as we're looking at this, I think a lot of our danger too is we make prayer our last resort, right? So how many of you have heard this phrase or said it? I've said it myself. Well, all we can do now is pray. Right, like we've tried the real things that work, right? And I don't, I don't want to deny um, that there are real things that we can do, that we can be engaged in, that can help with things, right? Um, if you know someone who has fallen on hard times, right, and you've had the opportunity to actually give to them, right, to care for them, those are real things that God prepared. But that doesn't mean that's what we do instead of praying, right? Praying is when we approach the throne of God, right? And all the Hebrews says we can boldly approach Him. So that prayer is when we approach the throne of God, the one who can actually do something about what's happening, right? The one who can actually intervene and the one who can actually control all of history, right? Those are the ones we're praying for. So we want, we want to do is we want to remember that prayer is our first response and not our last resort. Yes, we're involved in what we're doing. Yes, we obey. Yes, we give, we pray, we have uh, doctors who care for the sick. There's all these are real things that we can be involved in, but prayer is our first response. As we go to the one who it can actually 
make things happen, the one who can actually respond in a way. So and that's why Michael told me the core vor- verse, excuse me, core verse that he's really used for this series is in 1 Thessalonians, rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. And that's 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 to 18. I think when we hear, this is not the mes- point of the message, but I think it's important. Remember, when we, when we see pray continually and we think, how do we do that? Like, I got to go to work, you know, I got to do things. But I think the message we're getting here is as we're going, we're praying. Um, I'm, my wife and I just celebrated our 16th wedding, wedding anniversary and I'm still giddy about her and I still think about her all day. And so, you know what I do? I text her throughout the day. I'll think about something, I text her, right? And she thinks about something. That's that, I'm talking to her continually. And that's so much of what that pray continually is, just having that ongoing conversation. And we wanna pray first and in all things, okay? And so last week, Michael talked about uh, Luke 11 and Matthew 6, which is where we see the Lord's Prayer, right? And it is a masterclass in how to pray and in what to think about, what to pray for, and what to think about, what to pray for first and next, and, and that we're praying for God's glory and for God's kingdom to be here on earth. Not necessarily one that we have to repeat, but that it's a model of what we pray for. And this week, I want to talk about how to hear. So last week, it's how to pray to God, and this week, it's how to hear and how to make sure we're listening to the proper voice, which I think is so important as we're going into a new year, a new week, a new day or whatever. So after we have the Lord's prayer as a template to establish a relational connection with God, our heavenly father, to praise him for who he is. Um, But after we say our part, what do we do? How do we listen? What are we listening for? You know, we, we've talked, now we're listening. What are we listening for? So one thing I think is important to look at is something Jesus says in John 10. He says, the gatekeeper opens the gate for him and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. His sheep listen to his voice. They know what his voice sounds like. So I just got a new nephew. Uh, I, I have several, but this is, this is the first, my wife's sister's first baby. So very new excitement. Anyone who's had that first baby, um, you know, this is just thrilling right? So new. His name is Levi. Um, the only other, um, boy in that family, was naturally born boy in that family other than my son. And, um, so we've been really excited and I haven't met him yet, but my wife got to go meet him. And when she did, one of her favorite things to do, of course, is to think back on all the baby toys we bought for our kids when they were little. Uh, and so she wanted to make sure that she got Levi a gift that he would really like. And so she thought through one of the ones that's been the most exciting. I've actually, I think I've got a picture for it right here uh, is this toy puppy on the left. Probably you've seen this before, right? And it's great because like you can squeeze it, you can cuddle it, you squeeze his hand and like he says, hand, you touch his belly and I think he says his name. It's really cool. And sure enough, just like one of our children, that is Levi's favorite toy. And so we were really excited, but my brother-in-law told us that he, he, so he noticed that it was kind of a lot of work. All right. Um, like this toy's great and Levi loves it, but he noticed that Mike is his name. He's, he's like, okay, now my job is to squeeze his hand to squeeze his tummy. He goes, Levi, like, can't do anything. Y'all parents ever been there, right? You're like, oh, my job is to play with my kid's toy now. Okay. Can I do something else? And so he's trying to find a way that he can like go do other things. So what he did is he took that little owl because the owl also talks, but it talks for longer. And he put the owl behind the puppy in hopes that Levi would be fooled. But you know what he realized? Levi knew the puppy's voice. And Levi knew that what he was hearing wasn't the puppy's voice. And so the one thing I wanna really emphasize before we get into the rest of this message, because it's so important and you can get yourself into so much danger if you're not careful with this. It is so important that you recognize the voice of God. I don't know if you noticed, but there's a lot of voices out there. There's a lot of people talking. There's a lot of people saying things, but they are not all speaking for God. They are not all the voice of God. And so as we're going into this and as we're thinking through, as we pray and as we listen, it is so important that we recognize the voice of God. And that takes training. It takes discernment. It takes time that when we hear something, we think that's not right. That's not, that doesn't line up with scripture. 
And do I believe that God can prompt us and, and, and move us and, and give us steps to obey? Absolutely. But I also believe that we can, we can be fooling ourselves and hear voices that are not his and that are not holy and that are not making much of him. So I would just want to emphasize that so much as we go in there that I want to make sure we are thinking through the proper voice. And so as we get into 1 Samuel 3, the background of this is so great because there was this woman named Hannah and it starts off in it, Samuel, the author of 1 Samuel uh, just starts off with Hannah's husband's name and he has two wives and not an ideal situation. One wife has children. Hannah does not have children. So the other woman is mocking Hannah all the time and Hannah desperately wants a child. She's been praying for a child. She's not getting a child. So one day when it's time to go to the temple, just something they do once a year, she goes and she prays, prays hard. She prays so deeply that the priest actually is, who's there, Eli is his name, thinks she's drunk, tells her to leave, right? Ever prayed so deeply someone thinks you're drunk? That's where Hannah is. She is like, this is not a calm prayer. She is pleading, right? And she's like, no, 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 I'm not drunk. I am just begging for God to give me a child. And then Eli realizes that that's what goes on, tells her to go on, his way, on her way. And, and sure enough, God answers her prayer. And what she did is she tells him, she says, I will give this child to you. So you've heard this story before, probably, if you have any kind of a church background. Samuel gets just old enough, right, that she can, he can kind of walk around, take care of himself a little bit, probably two, three years old. I don't know how old he was, but he was little. And so she sends him to live in the temple. She wants him to be in God's presence. She gives him back. Now, the story we often forget, God actually gave her at least five other children after him. It's not like she went childless from there, but she sends Samuel to go live in the tabernacle, to go serve God in a professional capacity as a little boy. Okay. And so that's where we're following up with that. We've got this little boy coming in to the temple, right? So, uh, Eli, who's the priest there, he has two sons. Their names are Hophni and Phinehas. And these guys are terrible, right? They are literally preventing people who come to sacrifice from sacrificing the way God tells them to. They literally don't let them. And they're the priests. Even more so, they're having adulterous affairs with women who work at the temple over and over and over again. And Eli, their dad's not much better because he knows it's happening and he doesn't stop it. He fusses at him. He's like, boys, you can't do this. But he doesn't actually stop it. He doesn't guard what's going on at the temple. And so what happens is God sees this. He sees this corruption in the temple or in what would have been the tabernacle at the time. Tabernacle is like a it's like a movable temple. It's a tent, right? So I'll use those words. I might use those words interchangeably, but God sees what's going on. He's, ha he's had them create this tabernacle, this tabernacle. It's a sign. It's a visible way of remembering that God's presence is with them. It's a visible way of remembering that God delivered their ancestors from Egypt, from slavery. And so what's happened is these men are just abusing it and using it for their own good. They're the ones that are the priests. They're the ones who are supposed to help people follow God. And they're doing the exact opposite. And God sees that and he wants to do something about it. He's already answered Hannah's prayer. And what they don't know is that Hannah's prayer is going to be used to make massive changes throughout Israel. So that said, we're going to go and pick up with 1 Samuel 3, verse 1. It says, Now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord in the presence of Eli, and the word of the Lord was rare in those days. There was no frequent vision. I think we feel like that sometimes, right? We feel like God's not speaking to us, and maybe, not, maybe God's not around, okay? And, and for Israel, this was very real. There were times when there were prophets that would come in and have a word from the Lord, and there were times when he wouldn't. And this was one of those times. And it was easy to feel like God was not present because there wasn't some new revelation. But sometimes we have to realize that God is present. He's very real. Maybe you've said this before. I just feel like my prayer doesn't get above the ceiling. And at the risk of being trite, it doesn't have to because he's with you. And just because sometimes we feel like God's not listening, just because sometimes we feel like God's not answering prayers doesn't mean he's not. Sometimes it just means we can't hear his voice. We don't know what's going on. But again, for Israel, this was very real and they were waiting for something new. And, and it amazes me, here we are, we're starting off a new year, right? 2021, um, we're thinking through, so many of us, right? What we're gonna do this year. Maybe we've set resolutions. Maybe they're easy ones, maybe they're doable, right? This is day 10, 
So far, I'm good. I did my 10 push-ups and my 10 sit-ups. Oh, no, I forgot them yesterday. Um, so anyhow, I've already broken that. So we've got those resolutions, right? It's good, but are we thinking through what God wants us to do in this year? How he wants us to follow him, what he wants us, how he wants us to serve others around him, whether it's this year or in five years or in 10 years or in 20, right? I saw a quote on Twitter from a Bible teacher I love so much. Her name is Jackie Hill Perry. We all know that last year was rough, right? We're all hoping for 2021 that's better. And she said something. She said, even if 2021 isn't better, I'm going to be. So are we, no matter what this year holds, are we going to press in to look more like Jesus this year than we did last year? Are we going to press in to follow him more closely? The uh, Proverbs 29, 18 says, where there's no prophetic vision, the people cast off restraint, but blessed is he who keeps the law. Are we going to follow what God tells us to do? Are we going to follow the revealed word? Okay. Are we going to even more so look for where God can be using us places? You're gifted. Your, your natural talents are things God gave you that you can use for his glory. That's your sweet spot. Or maybe even have you been following something that's not of God at all? Maybe you've been following something that's really more selfish, really more sinful than just something God has called us to. We all have that tendency to do that. We want to follow our own selfishness instead of looking at what God has set for us, right? And we're not listening to what he's actually saying. So if you need a vision for your life, the first step is to listen to what God is saying in his real word, word, revealed word. Make sure that at any prompt you feel like him moving you to matches with that, that it matches his voice. So here we go, keep going. At that time, Eli, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim so that he could not see, was lying in his own place, the lamp of God had not yet gone out. So Eli is in his own home, right? He's not sleeping in the tabernacles in his own home. He's not staying there right in the middle of the night, but he's in his own home. Okay. But Eli's, or excuse me, Samuel's in a different place. And, and Samuel, it says, was lying down in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was. So we already see something different about Samuel. Samuel wants to be close to where God is. He, Samuel doesn't know much. He's really young at this point still, but he knows that that ark represents God's presence for God's people. And so he wants to be close, even as he's lying down at night. We think Eli, or excuse me, we think Samuel was probably about 12 years old at this time. That's a sixth grader. My daughter's 12 and in the sixth grade, right? That's, that's young, but he's still wanting to be near where God is. And I think one thing to remember here. If you're here and you're a, a kid, youth, some, you don't have to be old to be following God. You don't have to be old or an adult to, to wait to press into where God is. Be pursuing him now. One of my biggest regrets is that is not the story of my life. I knew how to behave as a kid and make it look like I was pressing into who God was, but I was not. So don't have that regret. Be pressing into where God is now as a young child. And Samuel positioned himself as close as he was to the presence of God, even though God speaking at the time was rare. And passage goes on to say um, that God is talking to him and he positioned himself because his heart was that he wanted to be close. And we'll keep going. Then the Lord called Samuel and he said, here I am. And he ran to Eli and said, here I am, you called me. But he said, I did not call you, lie down again. So he went and lie down. I love that passage. Samuel's so close to the presence of God. He's right there at the ark. God literally speaks to him, but Samuel doesn't recognize his voice yet. He doesn't know, like the puppy. He doesn't know that's God's voice. He just hears a voice. Oh, Eli needs me. What you need, Eli? We're so close, but we miss it because we don't know what he sounds like so many times. So many times God is moving us to obey. He's moving us to do something, but we don't know what his voice sounds like. So we miss it. Like some of us, God is speaking, giving direction, making moves, and our ears aren't even trained to hear. Maybe we've missed a moment. You probably feel like you've missed that before. Um, when I was ninth, 10th grade, I don't remember exactly, I went to a youth camp. For Some of you may know who Clayton King is. This was Crossroads Camp in the early days. Um, so I remember we went to this service one time, and at the end of the service, Clayton said, all right, guys, everybody line up. We're all going to go this way. I don't remember exactly where he told us going to go. I just remember we ended up by a pond. Okay. And I remember thinking, this is weird why we had a pond. But at the same time, I had this strange urge to take my shoes off and throw them in the pond. I was like, well, that's weird. 
Is that God speaking? We did have tacos for lunch. I don't know what's going on. But I had this urge. So I was like, well, I don't, these are $80 Birkenstocks and they make me cool. I don't want to toss them in the water. So I was like, oh, I'll just compromise. I took them off and I set them beside me. And so Clayton didn't tell us what we were doing when we got there. And when we did, he said, listen, guys, we're going to do a foot washing. And I was like, oh, maybe that was God speaking. And what I'd done is I'd obeyed it halfway. And listen, I don't, I don't know if that was God speaking to me at that moment, but I do remember thinking, man, if I'd actually obey what God tells me to do, if, if I can actually, if I can listen to a prompt and, and if I know that prompt sounds, yeah, this sounds like something God would tell me to do. This is something that would, it would match up with scripture. And if I'd actually obey it, then maybe this would look like a different life because I'd kind of halfway done it. Well, maybe I'll just set them beside me. And so it's so important to listen and to obey, especially if what we're listening to matches up with scripture. And here's the good news. Even if we miss it, he often calls again. And that's what we see here in the next verse. And the Lord called again, Samuel. And Samuel arose and went to Eli and said, here I am, you called me. But he said, I did not call my son, lie down. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord and the word of the Lord had not been revealed to him. So here we are, Samuel's a little kid. He's like a little Padawan, right? He's in training, he's there. The story tells that Eli's, that, excuse me, Samuel's mom, Hannah, used to make him a little ephod, which is what the priest wore. They would, she'd make him this little ephod and bring it to him, right? And, and that would be his neat. So like he knew how to dress like a priest. He knew how to serve like a priest. He knew how to offer the offerings, but he didn't know who God was yet or he, did, he knew who God was, he didn't know God. So we see there can be a very real difference between knowing who God is and knowing God. The, the author tells us that Samuel didn't know the Lord yet. He didn't know. That's why he didn't recognize his voice because he didn't know him. If you're looking to recognize God's voice and you do not know him, the first step is to get to know him so that you can know what his voice is. But God calls again and he speaks. And how many times that we, we don't hear the first time and, and God continues to speak to us. And so we serve a God who calls again. And, and even more so, I think, I want to say, we serve a God who knows our name. He calls him by name. He says, Samuel, God knows your name and he calls you by it. When he calls you to know him, he knows who you are. He knows your weaknesses. He knew Samuel was weak and didn't recognize his voice. That's why he called again. That's why he called him by name. Even though Samuel had lived in the temple and knew about him, he didn't know him. So here we are. We're in this 21 days of prayer. Want to grow your faith? Want to hear from God? He's still speaking through scriptures. He speaks as we pray and we can have that relationship. He does not stop speaking. So here we go again. And the Lord called Samuel again the third time. And he arose and went to Eli and he said, here I am for you called me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the boy. How awesome is this that Eli knew who it was? I mean, it took Eli a little while too. He's like, right. I didn't call you Sam. You just go back to bed. But after a while, Eli recognized what was happening. And again, Eli was not a good guy. Eli is not the one we want to emulate here. Not, not necessarily for what he did. His sons were the evil, evil ones, but he was the one who was over the tabernacle. He was the one who was letting it happen, even though he talked to them. So Eli is not to be commended here. And, and I would recommend on your own, go read the first two chapters before this. Read the next two chapters after this. This does not end well for Eli, but even Eli recognized that may have been God's voice. And so Eli was able to help Samuel understand what was going on. Even though he failed to be the kind of priest that he was supposed to be, he recognized God's voice enough that he was able to help him. Even though Eli was deeply flawed, he was able to direct Samuel into saying what he needed to do. And it helped him develop that posture to hear what else God had to say. And Samuel was quick to give credit to someone else. Well, God isn't talking to me, he must be Eli. But Eli knew it would be someone else. Sometimes we need someone who's a little more familiar with God's voice to tell us what's going on, to maybe confirm something. 
hopefully someone better than Eli. God was gracious to use Eli to help Samuel. He's gracious to use us, even though we are deeply flawed. But sometimes we need someone who maybe is a little more familiar with the voice of God to say, yeah, I think that may be God speaking to you. Yeah, oh, you, you've sent some sort of calling here. You have a desire to do this. Yeah, that sounds like something God would do. That, might, that may be something to take a next step on. Um, one way to look at that at groups are starting here at SOMA. And there's SOMA group semester, Easter through May. Do you know how to recognize the voice of God? Have you, are you someone who you've, you've been in the word before? You've had this relationship. You've known the Lord for a long time. You've learned to listen. You've learned to know, yeah, that's God. No, that's not God. <laughs> we may need you here working with groups, helping people be guided, be put in the right direction. Maybe you need to sit underneath someone who can say, yeah, that sounds like the word of God. That sounds like something that God would be saying. Even as flawed as Eli was, he was able to show Samuel the basics of serving the Lord and telling him that may be your voice. And I think all of us here, if we've learned to follow God, it's because we stand on the shoulders of people who have come before us. We've seen something about their life. We've learned something from them. Even if they're deeply flawed, like Eli, there's something we've learned from them that we can take. So one of the best things to do may be to get into a group, go to a dinner party, see what's going on, find a way to get connected with others who can encourage you, who can help you think through what you're praying about, what God may be telling you to do. And we need people who can confirm what God is calling us to. Sometimes, especially if it's a big step. Um, <laughs> a couple years ago, I started I'm a classroom teacher. I'm very, very happy in the classroom, but I also, I love to teach the Bible. And it's been kind of a weird spot. A couple of years ago, I started thinking, having this strange desire to go to seminary, even though I'm very, very happy in my classroom. And I thought it was dumb. So I just kind of kept it to myself for a while. Long story short, I talked to my wife. Uh, I'm, an, I'm very involved in a church in Statesville. I spoke with my pastor and they both said, no, I think this is a good idea. Go for it. And sometimes we need those people who say, yeah, this might be right. Go ahead and take that next step. We need somebody to listen to that we can call to. Let's keep going. The story progresses. Therefore, Eli said to Samuel, go lie down. And if he calls you, you shall say, speak, Lord, for your servant hears. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. So Eli tells Samuel, if you listen, if, go back. If he says it again, answer and do so with humility. Speak, Lord, I'm here to serve. And here's something, a humble heart prompts the voice of God. God wants to speak to humble hearts. When we come to him in humility, he wants to listen. If we come in arrogance, it's not something he wants to hear. A humble heart can give you fresh ears. It's a, prepare, it's a prepared soil for the word God wants to sow in your life. And he listens when we're humble. And we know this to be true even outside of faith. We don't like arrogant people. We don't like arrogant bosses. If you're a boss, you don't want an arrogant employee working for you. You want someone who's humble and who's happy to listen to what God is saying. So God speaks to the 12-year-old who wasn't even aware of what God sounded like. But because Samuel listens to Eli, he takes counsel from Eli, who's a priest, and he's going to listen to that guy, and he applies it. How glad are we that we serve a God who speaks as many times as we need it? We don't often listen the first time the second time, the third time. And God is patient with us as we go. And so here we go. And the Lord came and stood calling as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, speak for your servant hears. Then the Lord said to Samuel, behold, I'm about to do a, th a thing in Israel at which the ears of everyone who hears it will tingle. So God tells Samuel, I'm about to do something, right? God is an announcing God, right? Some of you had that dad, who stood outside of your room when you were in trouble. I'm about to come in there. You better be acting right. Right, y'all have that? Maybe you are that dad, right? God sends so many people. He literally creates a guy called John the Baptist to announce and say, repent, turn around. The kingdom of God is near <laughs> and this ain't always gonna be good. So you may have had that dad. You may be that dad, right? So Samuel's here and he didn't receive it the first, second, third time. God's communicating. Samuel doesn't know how to listen. And he finally gets it because of Eli, a washed up priest, helps him listen. He's there in the first place because his mom had prayed for him to come. 
He's there for the first time because his mom was obedient and took him to serve in that temple where she wanted him to serve. He's there because of people's prayer. He's there because Eli knows his voice and he's there and he listens to what God is saying. Samuel had a praying mom who had dedicated him to God's service. And because of this and God's faithfulness, Samuel was able to begin seeing what God had called him to do. And it wasn't always easy. In fact, as we're getting to this verse, you've probably heard it before. 1 Samuel 3, 11, behold, I'm about to do a new thing in Israel, which the two ears of everyone who hears it will tingle. You may have seen that on a coffee cup or a t-shirt. Maybe you've quoted it because God's gonna do some wonderful thing in your life. If so, be careful, that's a judgment verse. That new thing God is getting ready to do is to take Eli and his sons out and to put Samuel in because Samuel's willing to listen. Eli was more than flawed. He did not let worship happen the way it was supposed to happen. He did not lead the way he was supposed to lead. And God said, I'm gonna put Samuel in, this 12 year old who I know will listen to me. And I mentioned that Eli was not a good man because at best he looked the other way while his sons desecrated the temple worship. At worst, he was a part of it. Either way, God was moving from his leadership to faithful Samuel. And that's why God spoke to Samuel instead of Eli. That's what will make the ears tingle. The message is that Eli and his family will be judged. God is moving on. And Samuel, the sixth grader, had to deliver the message to Eli, the elderly priest. See, I don't, I don't know what God's calling is on your life. I don't know what it is for this month, for this year, for the next few years. But often I think we think that what God calls us to is to some sort of ease or to something where people are gonna make a big deal out of us. Because we look at these heroes of faith and we think God's there to make us famous, to make us a big deal. But often, something God wants us to do is to say a hard thing. I don't mean blasting somebody on Facebook where you've got some courage behind a screen. I mean, sitting across from one you care about and who you know is, is going the wrong way. And you say, hey, I, I think what you're doing is dangerous. I think you're gonna hurt yourself and a lot of other people. I'm concerned. And that's, that's what Samuel's having to do. He's having to say hard things. One thing you're gonna see in this next passage is Eli's gonna tell him, Eli knows. He's like, Samuel, what did God tell you? Just tell me. He knew he was in tough shape and Samuel had to tell him hard things. Sometimes it's just dropping our selfishness, not looking out for what we want, but for looking out for the needs of others that we need to fulfill. And sometimes our calling is super insignificant, at least in the eyes of those around us. Sometimes what we're called to do is not make a big deal of ourselves, but to make a big deal of the God who called us. Yeah, we know who Samuel is. We know who Moses is. But there are millions of people who have been faithful, who have done the small, hard things that God has called them to do, who have taken little steps of obedience, who have searched the scriptures to see if what they're hearing is actually from God, to make sure that those prompts or actually something God wants them to do. Those little, I think God's telling me to do this, is actually something God would tell you to do. Those are the millions of faithful people that God has used to do so many things. And we may never know their name, but God does. And God loves them. And I, when I think of this, I think of my friend, Mark. Um, I've known Mark for over 20 years. He and I went to different high schools together. Um, I joke because my kids know him and I say, listen, I've known Mark for 20 years and I literally can't think of anything bad to say about him. And there's not a lot of people I'm in that with. And um, Mark has looked out for me at times when I wanted to be a big deal. So there was a time when I was on church staff at a multi-site church and I thought God was calling me to be a big deal. I did. Now, if you'd asked me, if that was what I was thinking, I would have denied it. But so much of me wanted to be this next big celebrity pastor. It's just the reality. And, and Mark saw that, I, I think he did. And I remember I had coffee with Mark and while I'm talking about these big plans I have to be a big deal, um, Mark talked about his goal in ministry. And it's a phrase that has stuck with me for years now 
faithful obscurity. He said, that's what I want, Dan. I want, I want faithful obscurity. And I remember thinking that just sounded so lame. Faithful obscurity. Don't you want to be a big deal? Mark didn't fuss at me. He didn't tell me I was dumb or I was going the wrong path. He just, he talked about what he believed God was calling him to. Faithful obscurity. And here's the thing. Y'all don't know Mark, but I know Mark. You know who else knows Mark? My children. You see, Mark is my two older children's youth pastor now. And Mark knows their names. Mark comes up to them after church and he talks to them about their lives. On Wednesday nights, Mark faithfully teaches my children the Bible. So there's one more voice other than me at least who's helping them see what the voice of God sounds like helping them see what God may be calling them to with their lives. He writes my children handwritten letters. They got one this week where he talks about things going on in their lives, tells them what he's praying for them about. And you know what? I see the fruit of that. Because his faithful obscurity and being faithful to the small things is making changes in the lives of my children and so many others that I know have gone before him. And listen, you don't need a church paycheck to do that. All you need is the willingness to look at what God says in scripture, to pray. Like Michael talked about last week, your kingdom come, your will be done. To make much of his glory, to look at where you can be active in making much of him and not yourself. To maybe even think through what faithful obscurity looks like and that you're willing to not make so much of yourself because you want to make so much of him. And that's what so much of what he's called us to do, to be faithful where we are, to be obedient to what he's called us to. That's what his voice sounds like. And it sounds a lot like what he's already revealed in scripture, which is where we need to go and what we need to be willing to listen to. Let's pray. God, I thank you that you have made your word clear that you have spoken in scripture that you still prompt us now, you still speak to us now, that when we pray to you, you answer today. You you call us to things now. You have things you want us to do today. You're still living and active. You're still working in us. You're still showing us where to go. You're still giving us that next step. You're still showing us what it looks like to obey you. And God, I pray that we don't want to make much of ourselves, but that we want to make much of you. I pray for those who are sitting here and like 12 year old Samuel, they know about you. They know how to go through the motions of serving you. They know what it looks like at at a worship service. They know what things are supposed to happen, but they do not know you yet. They think they know you, but they don't. And they know they would not recognize your voice. God, I pray that we will all be attuned to your voice, to what you're saying, to who you are and that we will look to you and your wisdom that we will worship you and know that our step involves humility and obedience and listening to how we can serve others around us and love others around us and make much of you. If you're here and you're thinking, I I know about him, but I don't know him. Today's the day that you say, Jesus, I, I don't know you. I thought I knew you. I knew about you, but I want to know you. I want you to forgive me for, for trying to do my plans for trying to do what I think I should do and for never looking at what I think you're calling me to do. For where I think you're calling me to go. I wanna know you, I wanna worship you, I wanna go where you're calling me to go and I wanna start today. Please forgive me, make me yours. And he will. God, thank you so much for your word. Thank you so much for your people that you can speak through your people to encourage us to, that you give us others around us who can help us hear what you're saying. God, thank you for who you are, for what you're doing. And the fact that we can follow you and we can know you today in Jesus name.